Welcome to episode four of Greensboro Beautiful's Parisian Promenade, the home edition. My name's John Wagner, and I serve on the board of directors for Greensboro Beautiful. This is my wife, Ashley. Ashley and I volunteer for a number of Greensboro Beautiful events throughout the year. We're filming from the beautiful Tanger Family Bicentennial Garden, where Greensboro Beautiful presents the Parisian Promenade event each year. But as we mentioned in prior episodes, it was necessary to cancel this year's event due to the current circumstances. So we've created a way for you to experience this event um, at home. The home edition will showcase special garden areas, feature a few of the excellent artists and wonderful performers, provide a way for you to participate in an online garden quest, and at the end of this episode, we'll even have a virtual poodle parade. This is our final in a series of four 30-minute videos. We invite you to join in and share your comments. And if you like what you see, please use the link at the bottom of the screen to show your support. Now, during today's episode, we'll answer three questions on this week's Garden Quest, our virtual scavenger hunt. You can go to our website at greensborobeautiful.org and click on the Garden Quest link provided for a list of questions. And you can sub submit your answers at the end of today's episode. In today's episode, we'll be showcasing the Lillian Livingston Daylily Garden. Lillian Livingston was a longtime volunteer with Greensboro Beautiful. Until her passing many years ago, members of her family donated funds to Greensboro Beautiful to create this garden, which now bears her name. This garden boasts hundreds of unique and rare varieties of daylilies. And here to talk about it is Lynn Broderius Roberts, volunteer curator of the Daylily Garden. Welcome, Lynn. Welcome to the Lily Livingston Daylily Memorial Gardens. The American Daylily Society Triad Chapter, the Triad Daylily fans, has been curating them with love since 2015. This memorial is befitting for all the good work she brought to the North Carolina National Garden Club. Her kind leadership of the Greensboro Council of Garden Clubs right into the Greensboro Beautiful, sharing her passions as past chair of the Greensboro of the GBI Board of Directors. These four gardens contribute education as well as a unique beauty displaying the current hybridizing happening in daylilies today into our community and its visitors. Club members learn daylily garden judging and daylily exhibition judges observe the effects of weather, the plant habit as affects the growth of various cultivars here. This is Morning Breaks Eternal by Jack Carpenter in 2005. It's 26 inches tall. You see all the buds here. It displays a pattern and ruffling with a green, a yellow lavender watermark and edge. This worm is more so a flat than trumpet lily shaped with seven inch flowers. Four branches is a rule and you see it's very happy here so there's more than four. And each scape or branch has 28 blooms in the season. This is a double called Giggling Glory by Jan Joyner. She's one of my favorites. She's very well known for her doubles in all sizes up to eight inches. So this is a small, and it blooms early and mid-season, 22 inches high with a four inch flower. And you see the, the menagerie of buds all over as it's enjoying its spot. All this water has really helped make the daylilies happy. <laughs> this is skedaddle. You see the hybridizers do have fun at some point with finding names for their beauties. Skedaddle is by Bob Selman in 2011. It's 32 inches high. It's an eight and a half inch bloom. It's an unusual form crispate. It's got five scapes and you see because it's happy here, it has more than five scapes, but 35 blooms per scape throughout the season. Our season will go from May through November in this garden, so please do drop by. I have been asked more than once how many flowers are in our daylily garden. We have 107 cultivars in here, and each year we may remove one and put in another because we try to keep a lot of these current within the last 10 years, which are much more unique than what you buy in the nursery these days because those have been harvested and 
in the marketplace for 50 to 60 years before they actually get out. So the other big question is how many daylilies do we have that are in commerce today? And there are over 90,000 daylily cultivars and more each day. <laughs> I've been asked more than one time what this is when I'm walking in the public eye, but what we do for a flower show is we put our flowers, we're entering into these, each of these, and carry them so that they don't touch one another or mess them up because any little mishap can disqualify the flower in a flower show. And most people make their own. I just want to point out that this garden is available online at the Greensboro beautiful.org website. If you look under features for the Lily Livingston Memorial Daylily Gardens, and it will show you a picture and the name of the hybridizer, as well as the description that I've been giving you today on the flowers. And then our club website is, the, is listed here as well. Thank you, Lynn. Our first featured artist today is Dale Edwards. Dale has a particular fondness for utilitarian buildings like barns, grain elevators, and mills, and his style is modern and minimal. Dale joins us now to talk about his work. If you'd like to contact him, please use the link at the bottom of your screen. My name is Dale Edwards. I have been painting for about 10 years. I paint with oils. Um, I, was a, I am a graphic artist, and so when I got my beginning with uh, painting, I took some of the images that I created uh, on the computer and thought they would look pretty cool on canvas. So that's what I did. I just transferred um, some of my early designs to canvas and I started out by painting birds, very simple birds. My style is very minimal and simplistic. Um, I have started painting mostly architectural buildings. Um, and very uh, utilitarian style buildings. Uh, the barns, the, the grain elevators, the mills, sometimes railroads. Um, but I really like the clean, straight lines. We live in a very cluttered, constantly uh, noisy world. I like to clear all of that stuff out and make things very, very clean and uh, simple. It helps me breathe better, and I think that the people who generally like my art we, artwork appreciate that style. It gives them a chance to take a deep breath, and so that's how I do my paintings. You'll see in some of the paintings, I have very large skies, and that's very important to me because I just like to see a very big sky. Uh, it, it brings me a, a considerable amount of comfort to see that much. And then some of my buildings are much closer, but very angular. I like to paint from the second floor up, generally, because that's where most of the really clean and kind of cool angles happen. Um, part of my process for painting is I will find images. I just look them up on Google Images. I look up uh, grain elevators, like this one is a grain elevator that's in Ohio. And this is a grain elevator in Nebraska. So I just do a search for, search for them on Google and I will print off the images. Um, I will blow them up, and I have very straight lines, very clean lines. It's very important to me. I use painter's tape. I use rulers. Uh, I pencil out everything first and then go back with very, very straight brushes. To watch me paint is exceptionally boring because I'm very slow and very meticulous. I'm not very painterly and all over the place. I'll put you to sleep. But that's part of my style and uh, part of how it works. This is another grain elevator that I just looked up. I believe that this one is in Indiana. And I'm not really sure where that one is, but sometimes the images will have other things in a, a, other, uh, other buildings. They'll have trees in them. They'll have uh, power lines. I just clear all that stuff out and just focus solely on the building. Um, I tend to show my artwork at uh, art festivals. I've had shows at several coffee shops in the area. I've also had a show at the Green Hill uh, Art Gallery in downtown Greensboro. Much of, my, much of the artwork is at my house, so if you are interested in anything, you can just contact me and I could have you over to my house and you can see what I have on hand. Thank you, Dale. 
One of our featured performers today has been with us almost since the beginning. At many of Greensboro Beautiful's garden events, she has performed as a stilt walker, a hula hooper, and a fire dancer. Joining us now for a unique performance is Patika. Cet air qui m'obsède jour et nuit, cet air n'est pas né d'aujourd'hui. Il vient d'aussi loin que je viens, traîné par cent mille musiciens. Un jour cet air me rendra folle, sans foi j'ai voulu dire pourquoi, mais il m'a coupé la parole. Il parle toujours avant moi Et sa voix couvre ma voix Padam, padam, padam Il arrive en courant derrière moi Padam, padam, padam Il me fait le coup du souviens-toi Padam, padam Thank you, Patika. Now we're going to do something a little different, or at least I am. Joining us for a fencing demonstration is fencing coach Wes Caldwell. Welcome, Wes. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing all right. You enjoying the weather? I am. Well, as far as fencing goes, I have to ask you a question at the very beginning. Okay. Why did they adopt weapons like these and give up weapons like these? Probably for the weight. Weight was an issue, but this is just as deadly as this. True. Well, the reason is gunpowder. As more guns became prevalent on the battlefield, heavy armor became less useful. Also at that time, there was an increase in the number of people who were in the middle class, a lot of tradesmen traveling. Well, a rapier was a light and efficient weapon and very affordable. You could keep multiple attackers off for a long time. This was a means of self-defense. I'm gonna take you through a fencing lesson Okay, so first thing, you're holding the blade, okay? Put your thumb on top, fingers underneath, so you have a straight line from your elbow to the point. Okay. So you're like this, so let your elbow bend, there, and relax. Okay, this way, if you extend your arm, the tip will drop and leave, and you're not whacking people like that. Okay. Okay, now, put your feet together. Okay. Now your lead foot's gonna be your right foot, so you're gonna turn, there you go. Point your right toe at me. There we go. Point your blade at me. There we go. Take your front foot, step out shoulder width apart. Bend your knees. Now, hold still. So when your knees bent, your front leg, your knee should be directly over your ankle. And your back knee should be directly over your toe. Your back is straight and your head is up like you're sitting on a stool. Okay. So you're here. Okay? All right, so back up and scoot over a little bit. <clears throat> now, first move is in advance. So you're back on guard. There you go. So raise your front toe. Step with your heel. Now you're going to drop your toe and raise your back heel and your weight's going to shift forward. Bend your back knee, pull the toe forward, and put your foot down. That's an advance. Okay. okay. Going backwards, you take your back foot, reach with the ball of your foot, drop your heel, raise your front toe, bring your heel back, drop your toe. That's a retreat. To make it easy, just think of it this way. If you're going forwards, take your front foot and reach and pull. So reach and pull. There we go. With your back foot, Reach and pull. Now, if we both have sharp weapons, you have to be careful, right? Sure. So if I move forward, what should you do? You're back. You should go backwards. Back foot goes back first. first yeah. Okay. It's scary, isn't it? Yeah. And it's just a new one. Okay. I'm gonna go backwards, and you're gonna go forwards. There we go. Now you're gonna control this space. Yeah. Because if I do an action, and I get the space closer. I'm gonna catch you. Okay. Okay. Now we're gonna learn how to attack with the blade. This is called the lunge. Okay. So take a retreat for me. First thing for the lunge, extend your arm so your thumb is on top. Raise your front toe. Now be careful in this part. Okay. Watch, and then, then I'll tell you when to do it. You're going to drive with your back leg, kick out your front heel, and land. The knee does not go past your ankle. Okay. Back straight, head up for now. Eventually you'll get a lean to it, but not yet. Okay. Back leg is straight, back foot is flat. If you roll your ankle, you can hurt your knee. Okay. To get out, you're going to bend your back knee, your weight pulls. Then I'm going to drive with my heel and recover. Okay. Don't lunge that deep. 
Okay, there we go. And then recover. Good, now bring your arm back, your elbow to your ribs. Good, so now extend your arm with the lunge. Lunge, there we go, now recover. Good, very good. Now we're gonna play a little game. Okay, so, there you go, scoot over just a little bit. Make sure you're not gonna run into me, there we go. Now here's how this game works, okay? You're allowed one advance and one lunge to hit me. Okay. okay. I get as many retreats as I need. Okay. But I'm only allowed one advance and one lunge to hit you. Okay. We'll take turns. Yeah. We'll go slow to begin with. All right. Okay. You want to go first? You want me to go first? You can go first. Okay. So we'll go slow. Ready? Yeah. I'm going to do an advance. I want to retreat. There we go. And then I'm going to lunge. And now I missed, so it's your turn. So you do an advance. But I can only come. Yeah, and then lunge. There we go. Now it's my turn. Advance. Lunge. Now it's your turn. Good. Now it's my turn. <laughs> So it's all in the timing. Yeah. So if I can time you, I can stab you. Yeah. So it's hard to move that yeah, fast. It's hard yeah, to move yeah. that fast. Takes practice. There we go. And then you can get really sneaky with it. Oh. <laughs> or the wet grass will catch you. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> you know who the professional is. Well, I've done a little bit longer than you. <laughs> okay. So you go again. That's, oh, nice lunge. Very good reach. Okay. Now, to score points in fencing, all you have to do is touch them. Okay. You don't have to do anything heavy. Yeah. Just enough to depress that little tip. Okay. You're on what's called a strip, and it's anywhere from five to six feet wide. Okay. And there is room for a little bit of angling, but you're not gonna circle. Okay. Now, we talked about right-of-way earlier, okay? So, whoever has right-of-way is the person who starts the attack, who initiates first. Okay. So you might think we went at the same time, but the referee gets to call it. Weapon coming forward starts the threat. So if I'm doing this, and you stab me and I stab you, it's gonna be yours. Because you started yeah. an attack first. So then it becomes a little bit like chicken. Yeah. So as we're moving, yeah. as much movement as we want, and then start. Now I started first, okay. which triggered you to attack me, because oh, you're attacking me. Yeah. So I took control of your body and made you attack. Yeah. Now with real weapons, that's foolish. But for practice weapons, it's fine. Sure. Okay. okay. And then you'll add parries. So if you lunge to hit me, and I use my blade to deflect your point from hitting me, that's called a parry. You get a point for that? No, no, this is nothing. I just okay. stop you from hitting me. Okay. But in this position, yeah. I can do what's called a repost because you brought your target to me and I can hit you. Okay. So some really good fencers, this is all they ever move, lunge and hit me. Oh, that was my point. Okay. So they're all defense. Oh, yeah. But as you start to hesitate or creep for the defense, they're going to catch you. Yeah. So you start to figure people out on how to stab them. Okay. So fencing is a really fun game of tag with them. Yeah. All right. well, that was fun. Uh, thank you for showing me. You're very welcome. Do you have any questions or anything? I don't. Thank you. All right. You're very welcome. Thank you, Wes and John. Our next featured artist is Jean Pudlow. Jean specializes in marbling, which she applies to paper into fabric to create note cards and scarves. Jean joins us now to tell her uh, tell us about her work and her creative process. If you'd like to contact Jean, please use the link at the bottom of your screen. Welcome, Jean. Good afternoon. Glad to be here at the Parisian Promenade in Bicentennial Garden. Well, the virtual Parisian Promenade. I'm a marbler, and marbling is an ancient Turkish art, actually. Uh, if you're familiar with seeing patterns on the inside of books, that's a form of marbling. I do marbling on both paper and on fabric, and it's a similar process, but there are not more steps in, in fabric, and I'll talk to you about that a little bit. But what the painting method is, is you have a tray that has a, about an inch thick of water that's been thickened. I use carrageenan to thicken it, and then you sprinkle paint on top of it. After you sprinkle the paint, the colors are all mixed up, and you can mix them up further with different uh, combs and rakes and even barbecue skewers. And then after you have it the way you want it, you can take your paper or your scarf and lay it down on top of the where the paint is floating and it'll pick up the pattern. This is an example of one of the papers that I've done. So I use a tray that's a little bit bigger. Uh, this is 19 by 25 inches and the tray is a little bit bigger than that. And so when I lay it down on top of the 
tray where the paint is, it, I pick it up and there's the pattern all done. With my art, in order to share my art, I cut this paper like this into smaller pieces and I paste them on the top of journals or I paste them on the top of note cards. So when I sell a pack of four note cards, they're all different because they're from different pieces of this paper. It's not like a, a painting that's been copied by a printer, but each piece is an individual piece of art. So that's some of the way I share my painting, and that's, I like sharing my art. I like having art connect people to others, uh, which certainly it does with note cards and in journals. Lots of people buy them for gifts. Um, they help you connect to yourself, so I consider that a part of connecting and how my art connects. So when I make the scarves, instead of having a tray that's about this big, I have a very long tray. It's about six feet long and it's about 15 inches wide so that I can lay down a five foot long scarf on it. So it's the same kind of process. First I dye the scarves though, so there's a more chemical treatment beforehand. And then I lay the uh, pattern down on the tray and then I take a scarf and, and lay it down on the uh, tray as well. Then I have to wash it and then I heat set it. I use a special chemical uh, with the acrylic paint that I use to make sure it absorbs into a scarf. So they uh, show the color nicely and then they uh, are hand washable. Uh, you just have to be careful uh, not to rub them too hard. One of the things I do is lots of different patterns and this scarf is an example of a uh, type of uh, marbling. Again a Turkish thing where you can make lots of flowers or hearts or other patterns. In fact, hearts have become popular on uh, the top of coffee cups, right? When you have your cream and they, they take uh, a certain, they dip a circle on top and they take a skewer and go through and make a heart. Well, that's a marbling technique. And in this case, I made sunflowers. I saw some beautiful sunflowers at the farmer's market last fall. And I thought, why don't I turn that into my scarf? So that's uh, an example of one of the patterns, and I have several different kinds of patterns. Uh, I'd like to show you, because a lot of people ask, what do I do with the scarf? So you can just even just drape it around like this. Uh, if you have a sweater or a jacket, this works really nicely. Or a simple thing to do is to tie it once over like this, and then do a second knot like this. That gives you a little bit of a different effect depending on what kind of blouse or dress that you're wearing with it. One of the favorite things I like to do is a little more complicated, and I'll tell you, I learned this on YouTube. I can't exactly tell you which link right now, but you know, you can find everything on YouTube. But on one side, I make a knot like this. This is a nice way of tying it to have it up close to your face. And then I gather this edge here, and then the bottom edge as well, and I stick it up through this knot. tighten the knot that it goes into. And then you have it draping nicely right around your face and your shoulder. And so that's uh, another option for what to do with a scarf. I've seen people tie them around their head. Um, there are lots of different things you can do with scarves. I really enjoy my marbling and uh, I love that other people enjoy it too and share it with others. And it's an outdoor event and sometimes yeah. things change. <laughs> well, that was timing. <laughs> Our next guest is Greensboro Beautiful Volunteer and Chair of its Holiday Greenery Committee, Beverly Gass. Beverly is going to tell us about Greensboro Beautiful's Christmas in July sale. Every year, Greensboro Beautiful's primary fundraising event is a holiday greenery sale. We kick it off each year in July with special discounts on holiday wreaths, garland, poinsettias, and even light balls made by our volunteers. Beverly will also tell us, tell you about Greensboro Beautiful's note cards, which are available to order. The note cards feature scenes from each of Greensboro's four public gardens. By supporting this fundraiser, you'll be helping make Greensboro beautiful during the holidays and helping keep it beautiful all year long. Welcome, Beverly. The Holiday Green Reef Festival is a festival that's been a Greensboro tradition for over 25 years. It's a pretty cool one, and I remember when I was younger <laughs> going to it, but here I am still. 
And one of the really important things about the Holiday Green Reef Festival, it's a major fundraiser for Greensboro Beautiful. And we support the work of this fabulous organization through the, the litter cleanups, the tree plantings, these gardens, and the garden events that happen throughout the year. So it's a, it's a pretty cool thing, the Holiday Green Reef Festival. We pre-sale wreaths and roping and the lighted balls, another Greensboro tradition. We, we pre-sale those items. We have pickup day on December the 6th, it's a Sunday. And we're at the Lewis Recreation Center. And one of the really cool things about the pickup date for me is the wonderful fragrance of the greenery that, you, that consumes you and hits you, it's just fabulous. So it's a day filled with the joy of pickup and getting your wreaths and your holidays started and the wonderful fragrances of, of the holiday. These wreaths and the greenery are all ones that come from a, a North Carolina vendor. So we're very, we're very pleased about the products. They're really quality product and we're happy to sell them and we, we're really proud and, and that's pretty much what we sell. But this year, and as is usual, we're starting a Christmas in July sale. We're not starting it this year. We've done it for a number, but the kickoff of the sales of the wreaths and the greenery starts with July 1. And for the month of July, we have a 15% discount for these products. And in my mind, that's a pretty cool deal. The Christmas in July sale, as one would imagine, goes from July the 1st to July the 31st. But we continue to sell from July the 1st until not pickup date, but sometime in late November. So you have plenty of opportunity, but if you want to take participate in this great sale, do it in July. And you order online. You can call Greensboro Beautiful and order them. And now another part of this year's endeavor. Well, I say it's this year's. We've done this for a long time, but this year we're trying to focus on this special part of the Holiday Green Festival called Reeds on Wheels. We've done this for a number of years. And the Reeds on Wheels are Reeds that we donate to to the Meals on Wheels program and the volunteers deliver a free wreath to the participants and the recipients of these mobile meals. This year, we're hoping to be able to supply a wreath for every recipient of a meal. At this moment in time, Senior Resources of Guilford report that they have 530 meals they're delivering. So that's our goal to get 530. And the way we want to get to that goal is with your support by participating in our new sponsorship program. And we have many levels of sponsorship giving and we have, the, the names of these levels of giving are pretty cool in my mind. I didn't think of it, so that's why I think they're cool. The goodwill level, the peace level, the joy, the delight, the cheer, the comfort and the inspiration because the people who get these oftentimes, they're homebound and they don't have any other way to participate or celebrate Christmas except by themselves. So we hope we're helping that out a little bit. And you'll be, we hope you'll be hearing more about the sponsorship program because we'd like you to be a sponsor. So that's our sponsorship program for uh, Reads on Wheels. Let's see, finally, the, another thing that we sell, we started this last year, are our note cards. And these note cards are actual scenes, three each from each of our four gardens and quite frankly, they're pretty darn gorgeous. And you know, in this day and time, we're all into email and texting. It's pretty cool to be able to write a message with your own handwriting to someone, whether it's a thank you or a hello or how are you or a get well. So these note cards have many, many versatile uses. I trust you will support us and you'll buy a wreath, you'll buy several wreaths, you'll buy greenery, you'll buy lighted balls, you'll buy note cards, because we really count on this for Greens for our Beautiful. Thank you in advance and see you soon. Thank you, Beverly, and thank you for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed this and all the episodes of Parisian Promenade, the home edition, brought to you by Greensboro Beautiful. You can show your support by using the link at the bottom of the screen. Greensboro Beautiful makes this event possible each year with private donations from the community, donations from people like you who help us bring these events to the community, as well as tree plantings, litter cleanups, and continued enhancements to each of Greensboro's four public gardens. Donations of any amount are truly appreciated. 
We'd also like to offer a special thanks to the Greensboro Regional Realtors Association for funding support to 88.5 WFDD for providing promotional support for each of our garden events and to the city of Greensboro for this unique and wonderful partnership for the last 50 years. Now we'll close with our virtual poodle parade. I know that's what everybody's been waiting for. Thank you to everyone who submitted photos of their pets. But before we go, please mark your calendars and plan to join us for Art in the Arboretum on Sunday, October the 4th at Greensboro Arboretum. See you there. tell you about a dog I got born in Kansas City I picked him up in New Orleans I thought he was so pretty he's crazy about his lemon pie loves to eat green onions and digging taters from the ground his paws are full of onions he's my pretty little poodle dog got a face just like a frog I'm a pretty little poodle doodle doodle Pretty little poodle doodle dog. He's my pretty little poodle dog. Got a face just like a frog. Oh, my pretty little poodle doodle doodle doodle. Pretty little poodle doodle dog. He fell in love with the rooster once who lived down near my cabin. And every night when the sun went down, these two would start to gabbin. My little poodle would start to bark, the rooster would spring his crowing, and the way these two would bill and coo, you'd think the wind was blowing. He's my pretty little poodle dog, got a face just like a frog. Oh, my pretty little poodle, doodle doodle doodle, pretty little poodle doodle dog. He's my pretty little poodle dog, got a face just like a frog. Oh, my pretty little poodle, doodle, 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 pretty little poodle, doodle, dog. Well, 
they kept this up for six long months and then one night they fight it my little poodle came a limping home and he was all excited he came right up to me and said please don't give me a licking just get out the grease and the frying pan because we gonna have fried chicken